Hi guys, Terry Degani here from Hype Sports Innovation. We've got a treat for you today. We're continuing on with our Masterclass series, and today we're going to focus on performance and analytics on the field. We're looking at how innovation can impact this space. We've got four top experts in this field, and to kick things off, we've got the guru, Ben Alamar from ESPN. So enjoy. So I just want to talk for a few minutes uh, today about uh, um, you know sports analytics in general, and then uh, some of the big things that are happening in sports analytics, what we've been able to accomplish so far, and where we're headed, um, both uh, for teams and at ESPN. Uh, I do like you know Amir was kind enough to reference call me a guru. I really like to start these discussions off with uh, one of the true gurus of, uh, of sports analytics. Um, Charles Barkley, um, uh, who says, you know, analytics are stupid, analytics don't work. Uh, happily, uh, we've shown time after time after time this is just not the case. It's really hard to compete in a lot of leagues right now without good analytics. Uh, and that's because science uh, just doesn't care what you believe in. It cares that it's true. Uh, and, and analytics are, are, are things that, that work. Uh, it's a, a system. So, um, with that, I want to you know, lay the groundwork for how I view analytics. And to do that, I want to start with the purposes of sports analytics. So for me, there are two general purposes for sports analytics. The first is to save time. A good analytics system saves time for decision makers. Coaches, uh, uh, managers are, are very, very, very busy. Um, so if we can provide information more efficiently, um, and you know, more cohesively, uh, they can spend more time analyzing and less time gathering data and putting it together in a way that makes sense for them. The second piece is to provide better information. Um, so that's where we do you know, deeper statistical analysis and turn you know, the mass amounts of data that are available to us into usable information that can impact decision making. So with that, those two goals in mind, the framework that I use when I think about sports analytics is to split it up into three basic areas. The first is data management, bring the data within the organization together so a coach isn't having to talk to three different interns from three different areas of the organization to get you know, the, the health data, the practice data, and the salary data all together. Bring all that data together in one place. The second piece is predictive analytics. That's the modeling that we do to turn that, uh, that data, bring that data together into useful information. Uh, and then finally, creating the information system that a uh, decision maker can use to engage all of this information. So um, that's you know the, how they actually interact with the data that we have, whether it's you know scouting reports, uh, salary data, performance data. It should all be together in a cohesive way in the information system. Now the last piece for me when I think about sports analytics, though, uh, is the leadership of the organization. Uh, analytics is often a new uh, piece of set, uh, way of, uh, of making decisions for organizations. So if leadership is not on board, it makes it much, much harder. So uh, if leaders don't, for example, insist that old school scouts actually use and be familiar with an analytic type information, they won't. They won't change their behavior without reason. That's you know, human nature. So uh, strong leadership is always important to truly be successful in utilizing analytics in a sports organization. All right, so with that basic framework, let's talk about the future of sports analytics. To talk, talk about the future, though, we really got to start at the very beginning. Um, and in the beginning, we had box scores. Um, box scores are great. They have a you know, basic summary of the entire game in one place. You have a few lines. You see basically you know, what has happened uh, in that game. You can read it and understand it. It's very clear. Now, it lacks context. Uh, we don't know. Chamberlain here has 100, scored 100 points. How did he score those points? We, we really don't know very much about it. Um, so there's not a whole lot of context. But even with just the box score kind of data, the summarized kind of data, we're able to pull out a lot of useful information. Um, and you, you know, using tools as simple as Excel, you can really get into some, some new ideas with uh, just box score data. But the sports data has evolved. Uh, to play-by-play -play data. And play-by-play -play data gave us more information. Again, it's a summary of the game still. We still get, uh, you can still read it and understand how the game progressed. And now we get a little bit more of the dynamic of what's happened. 
you get uh, in, often in play-by-play, -play, you get who's actually on the field of play at, at any given time. So you're able to uh, get you do plus minus kind of analysis in a variety of ways. And so that it's, it's, again, it's, it's useful. You can get a lot out of it. Um, but it's still, we're lacking a lot of context because in any play-by-play -play data set, you really know what one, two, maybe three players did on any given play where, you know, you really, there, depending on your sport, you know, there are 10, 22, 20 uh, people who impact every single moment of every single game. Uh, and so we don't have that kind of um, context. But we do have, you know, some, from this kind of play-by-play -play analysis, we do, and box score analysis, we can do some interesting things and we can see how the game has evolved. For example, we can see one of the early results in basketball was shocking that three was more than two. So we should take th you know, more three-point shots than two-point shots. And you can see since the, you know, sort of the beginning of an you know, where analytics became a part of the uh, basketball culture, um, it's real growth in the three-point attempts over time uh, as analytics became more part of the game. In football, we can use play-by-play -play data to do uh, what we did at ESPN, which is called total QBR. This provides more context to a quarterback's performance using a, an expected points model. We're able to actually uh, make an attempt to separate out how the quarterback impacted every other every play, as opposed and from the rest of the other 21 players on the field. Um, so this was not a perfect uh, solution, but a big step forward using this kind of play-by-play -play data to get more information out of um, uh, what we had, which previously the measures of quarterback play were pretty, pretty poor. Um, so now we've improved, uh, but then we had a big leap forward. Um, we had, we moved from, you know, this play-by-play uh, uh, -play data to, uh, player tracking data where we know the where everybody is on the field of play 25 150 times per second uh, and so now we know everything that happens all the time and so that's when we have real data and so there are two you know basic technologies that are, are used to do this uh, we have uh, optical tracking cameras um, that monitor the player's performance uh, location or they have put chips uh, in, in shoulder pads or on, on the body in some way to monitor via, uh, you know, a, a radio signal in some way. Um, and so that, that kind of, that's a data explosion. And so once you do that, you have data that looks like this. Um, and what's interesting about this data is a leap forward is this data by itself, you look at the other previous sources of data, um, you could read those and understand something about the game. There's nobody can, that can look at this game, uh, this data that, that's on your screen right now, and have any sense of what's happened in this game. It's much, much better data, and the potential for this data is much, much stronger than the other types of data. But it doesn't, ex you know, nobody could just look at it. You can't, uh, you can't even just bring this into Excel and get anything out of it. You have to have much deeper levels uh, of uh, data analysis skill. You need to be going into machine learning and artificial intelligence to really get interesting things out. But once you do that, sky's the limit. Um, for example, um, you can identify in this data uh, every time a defense switches on a pick and roll. So in basketball, it's a particular way of playing defense uh, where to the defenders switch who they're guarding as the pick occurs. So we can now identify and know how often that happens in every single game and how effective it is in every single game. And once we start to see, be able to identify those and count those and measure them, you can start to see the, the amount of time that the numbers, how the frequency with which teams are actually switching is going up because it's becoming a more effective play and people are understanding that. And so it's changing the way we uh, play the game of basketball to have this kind of data, this level of, of insight into the game. Now, um, we can do a lot more than that. Um, for example, we can look at uh, uh, decision making. So here, here's a, a, a quick uh, uh, highlight clip that we used um, when we're looking at, at a uh, decision that Lonzo Ball made early on in his career last season. All right, so Lonzo Ball appeared to make the right play here, finding Ingram for an open outside look. But based on where Lonzo was on the floor, 
combined with the position of the defense, okay? Second Spectrum says he had about a 44% chance to actually make that basket if he decided to just shoot there. Instead, he dishes it out to Ingram at the three-point line. Yeah, the shot went in, but once again, based on the position of defense, Second Spectrum says that typically you'd only make that about 33%. Of so that's a situation where Lonzo made a bad decision with a good outcome. So uh, we want to make sure that we can use that as coaches to inform his decision making in the future and say, celebrate, yeah, we won the game. That's great. But let's think about in the future, better decision making so we can do a much better job with this kind of data of evaluating that kind of decision making than we could before. Whereas before we could guess maybe he should have taken that shot, maybe not. Now we know we have real data on it. Um, we can go deeper in, in, in baseball. There's having a huge impact of this kind of data on, on analyzing, uh, you know, exit velocity and launch angle are the hot things right now in baseball and understanding what they mean and how likely uh, plays are to be home runs and such. Uh, in the NFL, we can look at things like average time to throw, um, which we couldn't, you could, you could actually do this before. You could put a stopwatch on it, but you couldn't do it efficiently. There's no way you could get time on every single play in exactly the same manner uh, without this kind of data. Um, and we can go, we can see a little bit uh, beyond this. We can look in basketball, shot quality. So instead of just field goal percentage, we can look at see based on how you were being defended and how you created that kind of shot, you can look at how, how good a shot is for you as, a, as an athlete. Um, so that, again, these are, are things that have been done already. The next step is to, to go well beyond this. Uh, we're working now with this kind of data in the NFL at ESPN to basically download the brains of NFL quarterbacks into the machine to really understand their decision-making process on any given play. Uh, so you can see, for example, in the Super Bowl, Nick Foles for the Eagles did a, you know, made several plays that were extraordinarily aggressive. Um, and you can look at how, whether that's a trend for him over time, if he is making high percentage throws, if he is being aggressive with his throws, and then make the trade-off whether the aggressiveness of his throws are worth the, uh, the, the risk he is taking when in overall uh, production. Um, so the, to me, this kind of data is changing what, the kinds of questions we can ask about athletes and how we can uh, understand how they think and how they perform uh, on an, an any given situation. Um, so with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions uh, about, about this. Excellent. Ben, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, you mentioned something about downloading the brain of the brilliant quarterbacks into, uh, into uh, our computers. Was it, did I hear it right? Yes, yes. So the idea is we're using machine learning to look at this data and how they you know, what, now we can see what they're seeing when they're making throws. And so we can see all the options that were available to them and how they're making the decisions that they're making. Uh, and so that's, that's the process we're going through. Great. Now, I spoke to uh, uh, one of the, uh, the innovation director of one of the clubs, the CEO clubs in Europe, and he, he was saying that uh, he's very much looking forward to see, to, to allow the fans to see you know, Messi's uh, heartbeat in the last minute uh, or uh, his anxiety level when he's shooting the final uh, 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 penalty uh, in soccer time. What for you, if we're looking at futuristic, crazy innovation that will take place as far as analytic performance in few years' time, can you give me something which is, you know, will blow our mind? Yeah, so what, what I'm, one of the things that I think is really uh has potential to we can we can do and we're getting we're moving on this path is to basically take a you know one athlete and when you when when an athlete changes teams we often don't we have an understanding of their skill set in certain ways we can get better on estimates of their skill sets through this data but what we can do even better is take them and put them on the the team and see how they would actually function in a different kind of system um, and, and so we can get a much better understanding of how they work on the team that we're you know, trying to bring them into as opposed to making you know, guesses based on the skill sets and how we think that they're, they're gonna play. Now we would, you know, based, because, because we'd be able to understand how they uh, make decisions, how they react to different situations, um, once they're given a different strategy, a different set of rules to follow, how will they respond to that? Those are the kinds of things we're gonna be able to do. 
So what you're saying is we would be able to bring the hologram of the, of a player two months before he's coming to make sure that he can fit the team. Yep. Wow. All right. Thank you very much, Ben.